Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Friends of River, uh, the Wallala River's celebration of Earth Day. It's hard to believe that we've already had 50 Earth Days. I'm Laura Baker, Chair of the Education and Outreach Committee, which is organizing the event. In a few minutes, we'll be introducing our guest speaker, but first, a few housekeeping details. Uh, we want to encourage your questions. Please enter them into the chat box and our technical support person, Carl Danskin, will tell you a little bit about that. Um, we're going to have 40, 45 minutes of um, Dr. Katz's talk and then 15 minutes or so of questions. So we are going to try to get to everyone's question, but it may not be possible. Um, so we just wanna let you know that in advance. Um, Chris Pullman will be curating those questions and bundling them so we can get through everyone's if we can. So now I'd like to introduce Carl Danskin, who's our technical support person. He's gonna take a minute or two to make sure that everyone is comfortable using the Zoom uh, features. Carl? Thanks, Laura. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm gonna assume that people are pretty used to using Zoom by now. Uh, you're all gonna be on mute, uh, so you won't be able to speak up, but we do you know, wanna get your uh, questions or, or comments, concerns. Uh, so we're gonna do that through chat. And on the bottom of your Zoom screen, there are a number of icons. And one of them is the chat icon. If you click on that, it opens up a little chat window and uh, it says two and you choose everyone. And, uh, and then just type your message or your question this is how we'll get the questions is to you choose everyone and then type your question in and uh, hit return and it'll pop up, you'll see it. And then we'll be uh, you know, looking through those questions and trying to figure out what's the best thing to propose to Dr. Katz. So that's all. Thanks, Carl. For those of you who aren't familiar with Fogger, we are a nonprofit all volunteer organization that has dedicated itself to protecting the Wallala River, the watershed, the native plants and wildlife that make their home in the watershed. You can read about our successful actions in detail on our website. Uh, with so many years of experience, we've had some amazing things happen. There was someone who, who proposed stealing the water from the river and towing it in a water bag, a giant water bag out in the sea. Um, we were part of the defeat of Preservation Ranch, which was going to be a gigantic development in the upper watershed and um, all kinds of things. We've done lots. Uh, and of course, sometimes we have to sue. Uh, we don't like having to sue, but it's a necessity to protect the river at times. But we're also devoted to trying to provide the community with good, solid, science-based information about the watershed and that's what tonight's event is about. Of course, all of that takes money. And this event is free because we wanted to have as many people join us as possible. But if you appreciate the work that we do and you're happy with that, then we would appreciate your donations. Every dollar that you give to us uh, goes directly to the work that we're doing. So you can find information on how to donate in the chat box in a few moments. We also want to welcome people who are new to us and would like to become members. We also would encourage you to join us. Uh, we always can use more volunteers with there's this community has an amazing group of people with skill sets that they can share and we would love to have your participation. Finally, I want to thank the board of Fogger and the Education Outreach Committee for their continuing work. And I'm going to give a special shout out to our uh, Emeritus Fogger President, Chris Pullman, who was the driving force behind organizing this event. You will find that he will be curating your questions tonight. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jacob Katz, who will be speaking on resiliency and recovery in California Salmonids. Jacob is senior scientist with California Trout a nonprofit organization whose mission is 
ensuring that resilient wild fish thrive in healthy waters for a better California. Long before he received his PhD and began his research career, Jacob discovered early on as a boy that he loved the water and most especially the fish that live in the water. It's become his uh, personal mission to find ways to help restore California's iconic salmon, trout and steelhead. And this is a subject of enormous importance to those of us who love the Wallala River as we watch our native salmonids declining and disappearing. So we are looking to Jacob for um, uh, talk about some of the successes that he's had. So welcome Jacob and thank you for joining us tonight. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a, a, a great privilege to be here. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a coastal boy, um, born and raised uh, in the Russian River and uh, went, to, uh, went to the Big Valley to, to go to school. Um, and uh, haven't quite been able to uh, to get out of the grips uh, of of that great conduit of water down the middle from the down the Sacramento through the Delta and and to point south, um, largely because it's the stage that allows allows fish to really take their proper focus and and, and place as the as the proxy as the indicator of not just healthy waters, but the way in which we as humans, we as Californians steward our landscapes. Because that's what fish are. They're, they, they're a direct, um, they're directly, they're, they're responsive to, to, our, to our management actions, to our land uses, to the way in which we envision and, and live upon uh, the landscape. So, with that in mind, I would like to share a screen and some slides about um, the work that I've been fortunate enough to partake in over the last um, about decade and a half or so. But before we make it to the Central Valley, I got to introduce you all to a dear friend of mine uh, and uh, hopefully you know, a neighbor of yours. Um, say hello to Lavinia Parvapinis. This is the Gualala Roach. Now I know we're going to, um, you know, er everyone tends to have a, a case of what we call adipose disease. Adipose fins are the, here, there, that, oh, you can't see it there either. But they're the small little fatty fin just, uh, just up, upstream of the tail on a, on, a, uh, on a salmonid. So we, you know, there's so much of conservation, so much of, uh, our focus is on uh, the salmon and trout, but let's not forget these uh, these other fantastic members of California's freshwater fish fauna. And this one right here is is uh, the Gualala roach. You've no doubt seen the roach if you've dipped your your feet into into the river, either down there at Mill Bend or up at the North Fork or at Twin Bridges. Um, this is the most common most common fish you'll, you'll probably see in the, in the river uh, along with, with juvenile steelhead. Um, but it's remarkable because this fish is found nowhere else. This is uh, the Gualala roach uh, and uh, Peter Moyle, my mentor and I were, you know, I was fortunate enough to work with him to, to resurrect this, uh, the Gualala roach to full species status. Yes, folks, for a full 50 years, uh, the roach had been uh, considered uh, a measly subspecies, and um, to those who love these fish, uh, it is clear that it is it is very distinct. That it has lived and existed uh, in the Gualala River for years, probably accessing the Gualala through what we call headwater capture uh, uh, on Austin Creek. So Austin Creek comes out of the Russian River. It's the uh, the first major tributary uh, to the north, right, and comes up and is separated from the South Fork of the Gualala uh, out on the ranches in Casadero. Uh, and at some point in the past, a fish would have been up there in the headwaters of Austin Creek and there would have been a landslide and suddenly it would have found that it was now in the Gualala River. And uh, in that way, this fish for the last, hmm, it's hard to say exactly how long, but has been existing and differentiating on its own, on its own path in the Gualala. Um, so what you're looking at is the, the, the Gualala's only, you know, actual uh, endemic species, a, a fish found nowhere else on earth, something to be proud of, 
Yes, it is a minnow. It's actually technically a minnow. It is of the saprinid uh, uh, um, uh, genus, meaning the, the true minnows. Um, but it's a beautiful little fish, and I hope you'll look down into the waters next time and uh, uh, that you're out there and see it and and appreciate uh, a, a unique piece of California's great natural heritage that belongs to the Gualala and nowhere else. Um, so uh, Lavinia parva pinnis, parva meaning diminutive, pinnis meaning wing or fin. So it's the, the little finned roach, your very own. Um, but we should probably get to some on its, to salmon, to trout. Um, there are 32 different kinds of salmon and trout in California. It's an amazing diversity. It's an amazing diversity that speaks to the amazing diversity of California itself. It's diverse, it's heterogeneous landscape, this fantastic uh, state that goes from the, the, the lush redwood rainforest that we know and love so well to the deserts of, the, uh, of, of, of Death Valley, from the lowest to the highest spots in the continental US, all right here in California. And that incredible landscape diversity has led to uh, a, a similar diversity in, in, you could call it rivers, streams, we tend to call it hydrology, but the pattern of flow across California's landscape is such and so diverse that we have had a, a great uh, bloom, a great uh, 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 expansion of, of just very few, few species into very many. Um, and a lot of that's due to this incredible capacity of salmon to swim in from the ocean back into their freshwater habitats and kind of get stuck somewhere or other and end up on their own evolutionary trajectory. So over, over evolutionary time, over millennia, uh, we've, we've developed 32 separate kinds of, of salmon and trout in California. Uh, well, so, um, before we jump into, in, into, into conservation, though, I was just thinking about that, that, that diversity that we see across the landscape also goes on through time, right? And we all know this spot in the Gualala as, you know, you're coming out of, out of Sea Ranch and you want to pull off and look down over the estuary. And uh, as we just saw, and I saw many of the, the folks responsible uh, for acquiring the Mill Bend, uh, you know, are here today, and I just, my... My greatest uh, appreciation and thanks for all that work as a community to acquire this land. But it didn't always look like this, right? Over 120 years ago, you're looking at the mill site on the other side. Of course, after 1906, it looked very different. This is actually a little older. I think these are all the uh, uh, historical photos that were supplied to the PD by, by Dave. Um, but just a reminder that this beautiful estuary, this beautiful river that we see right now has been tremendously altered um, over really the relatively recent past, right? And so when we look down now on a, on a uh, you know, on this beautiful uh, placid and seemingly uh, uh, functioning estuary, know that there has been, it has, has been fundamentally altered from the way that it was originally found, right? I'm not exactly sure on the date on this, Dave probably knows, but you can see, you know, Gualala was a very different place 50 years ago. And the Gualala River and the Gualala watershed were, were fundamentally, you know, uh, uh, affected by, by these landscape scale uh, human endeavors, by human land use. In this case, by logging and the uh, attendant road building and changing of the way the water flows across the landscape. So, um, you know, now that we're rooted in, in the Gualala, we, recognize that salmon, Pacific salmon, Oncorhynchus, hook-nosed. Um, Oncorhynchus are uh, a genus of, of salmonid, uh, the five different salmon species that we know here, as well as two from the, from the, uh, the Western Pacific, from Kamchatka and, and Japan and Korea, uh, as well, and then the steelhead, um, are, you know, denizens of the cold Northern Pacific. And here in California, we're at the extreme southern end of, of anadromy, of the, of the life history trait of, of being born in the relatively safe uh, freshwater environments, swimming downstream to the sea, spending the majority of, of the life cycle at sea, acquiring those 
abundant marine nutrients, all of that energy from the ocean and bringing that energy back as, you know, in the flesh of adult, adult salmon back into the headwaters of our rivers from, you know, on this side of the ocean, you know, from Alaska all the way down to uh, the peninsula and, and uh, you know, coho uh, in the Santa Cruz region are, are just about as far south as, as salmon go and the steelhead extend down into Baja. But here in California, we're at the extreme southern end of, of, the, uh, of the distribution of the species. And that's uh, remarkable given that the Sacramento River, the Klamath River as well, but the Sacramento, uh, especially at the extreme southern end of the range of Chinook or King Salmon, still produced 2 million fish a year swimming through the Golden Gate. Remember, the Golden Gate's not a bridge, right? It's, a, it, it's the opening into the greatest bay on the west coast of the Americas, the greatest series of wetlands on the west coast of Americas. And 2 million salmon on an annual basis would swim into the Golden Gate and half of them would turn left up into the Sacramento and the other half would turn right down into the San Joaquin. Those San Joaquin runs are almost non-existent now. Uh, and sadly, the Sacramento runs are also struggling, but there's, there's hope and that's what we'll, we'll talk about today. So of those 32 kinds of, uh, of, of salmon and trout in the state, um, uh, Peter Moyle and I published a series of papers um, along with other co-authors that actually created a, a means of, of comparing the conservation status of all, of all fish so that you weren't waiting for a fish to be petitioned for endangered status before you actually went through the very fundamental conservation act of a, determining how it was doing, determining if that population was robust, determining what the threats to it, uh, to, to the persistence of that population may be. Um, and so out of that came this, uh, this paper called Impending Extinction of California Salmonids. Not a rosy title, but one that speaks to um, the level of landscape scale change that we see in California's rivers. Um, and what I hope you'll take from this by the time I'm done is to, not be surprised that we have endangered fish, but instead to marvel that we still have so many with us. And that because of the incredible resilience of these critters, because of the incredible capacity that they have to adapt to the landscape of their origin, to the rivers that we love, we have a real opportunity in front of us now to actually integrate a knowledge of how rivers work and how fish use them into the way we manage them. And in so doing, fundamentally change this graph and the, 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 the long-term odds of our, our fish populations. I believe that's entirely possible and believe I, I almost to the extent that it's inevitable because what we're learning is that investing in nature-based solutions that integrate a knowledge of nature into how we manage it, whether it's integrating a knowledge of fire and the spread of fire through forests into how we manage our timber or understanding that grasslands co-evolved with ungulate grazers and that um, interrupting those the, the flow of fire or, or grazers across grasslands, you know, interrupting fire through timber, grazers through grasslands is very similar to interrupting the flow of water across the landscape. Uh, and that in each one of those places, we have an opportunity now to to really start to manage with nature instead of against it. And in so doing, produce an entirely different set of outcomes. And what do I mean by different set of outcomes? Well, right now, the Central Valley Chinook salmon, again, I already spoke to it, but it's the southernmost population of Chinook salmon in the world. Um, it is the most diverse uh, population of Chinook salmon. There's actually four different species of, of Chinook or runs of Chinook that come into uh, into the Central Valley. And that's because of the other thing I had talked about, the incredible diversity of, of water patterns, of rivers that flow into the San Joaquin, into the Sacramento and out through the Delta and Bay. Um, what does that mean? Well, it means that the fish have adapted different ways, different strategies of taking advantage of exploiting those different aquatic habitats, different, different habitats in space and in time. And I'll get into, into what those different runs are and, and how a knowledge of that natural history 
uh, really gives us the tools necessary to bring them back. Um, of course, on the coast, we have not only kings, but coho. And our silver salmon, our coho salmon are also really um, teetering on the brink. Um, and so we'll, we'll get a chance to, um, hopefully at the end of this talk, um, coho don't, don't live in the, in, in the Central Valley. And I will be talking a lot because that's where my research has been focused about the valley. But we'll take our questions and answers uh, and, and uh, a conversation afterwards to really hopefully transfer some of what we've learned about river uh, function, about ecological function, about how fish use streams uh, to talk about coho and, and coastal streams. So the same thing that we are talking about in the 32 different kinds of, of salmon and trout is true for the nearly 130 different kinds of fish that live in California. And that's to say that not only are many of them endemic, meaning they're found nowhere else on earth, but also a majority of them are in steep decline. And this work was the first done that looked at all of the different species uh, and kinds of fish in the state. Um, rather, again, than just relying on kind of the regulatory apparatus, the state and federal endangered species acts, which are really political instruments. This was a, a means of actually uh, interrogating, asking how are the fish doing across the state as a whole, all different kinds of fish, right? So we've all heard about the Delta smelt and it's you know, central place in not just water politics, but uh, politics generally. Um, uh, but there is this amazing uh, 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 diversity, this, this rainbow of, of, uh, of evolutionary potential that we see in, in California's uh, native fish fauna. Uh, you have a, a steelhead in the upper left there. Uh, the next, just to the right of it, the little blue guy is a, is a devil's hole pupfish. Uh, there is a a whole array of pupfish found in the springs of the Armagosa River and uh, in and around Death Valley uh, that are remnants of a much, much, much wetter past. Uh, a past that would have seen those desert valleys of the basin and range as interconnected lakes. And as the climate has got more and more arid um, and those lakes dried up, these fish uh, were reduced to living in the small, often thermal springs, uh, the hot springs that, that flow in the desert. And in each one of them, you, you kind of think of it as, a, as an island of water in, a, in, a, in an arid sea. Um, those, they're, they're miraculous fish. I'd love to talk more about them sometime. Um, but uh, the devil's whole pupfish, of course, probably has the smallest home range of any vertebrate on earth, living only in, in the, the small little opening of devil's hole in Death Valley. Um, but to the right here, we have uh, the Sacramento sucker. This one is from the Russian River. Uh, the split tail you'll see uh, held in hands there with that large, this caudal fin. Uh, uh, the caudal fin, of course, is the tail. Uh, the, the Sacramento split tail is also is closely related to your beloved hitch uh, and once swam up Clear Lake and other, other streams uh, by the millions. Uh, the Sacramento perch right there, ideally suited uh, and evolved to, uh, to live on the valley floor. Um, it is the only member of uh, its genus of, of uh, the sunfish family, um, the, the, the basses and, and bluegills, et cetera, to be native west of the Sacramento. But it sadly has been completely extirpated, meaning it, it no longer exists in its native range. Um, and, and there's a bunch of reasons for that. Going through this seeming, you know, it's kind of a, a litany of woe, is it not, right? We, we often hear about, you know, environmental stories that, are, that, are, that, that seem to have this, this similar refrain, which is, you know, uh, uh, an unchecked march towards extinction. But that's not what this talk is about. Simply understanding whether it's the sturgeon or the salmonids in the corner, all of these fish are actually facing similar threats. And what's really empowering about that is to understand that it's not just the ground wells that the city of Nevada is, or the city of Las Vegas is placing in Nevada just across the California border that are drawing down the water in those springs I talked about for the pupfish, or the logging practices that so fundamentally changed our coastal streams, or 
the Klamath dams, which impeded the upstream progress of the, of the Klamath Spring Chinook. Um, all of those things are true, but there's a larger pattern. And that pattern, when we understand it, gives us a pivot, a pivot that moves us away from a myopic look at specific problems to a chance to look at the processes that underpin ecological function. What do I mean? I mean that we've been, as conservationists, for far too long, putting Band-Aids on cancer, treating the symptoms instead of the underlying causes of environmental decline. And what we can see, if we look to the fish, is those causes of environmental decline within river ecosystems. And if we can treat those river ecosystems, if we can pivot towards process, if we can start to actually manage the landscape scale natural processes, which create and sustain the very habitats that these fish need, if we allow them to recognize their home waters, what we'll find is that they respond and they respond dramatically and quickly. Uh, we, have, we have great evidence of that in the, in the very few places that we've actually been able to address every link in the life history chain of a fish. Because a fish, like any living thing, right, it, it is dependent on, on each link in that, life, in that life history. Each life stage has to be successful. Um, and so that's uh, really what I wanna, wanna talk to you about today is the lessons that we've learned in the, in the Big Valley, in, in, in the Sacramento and San Joaquin about what a river is and how it functions, how the flow of water across the landscape is what a river is, that it's not solely a thin blue line between two levied banks. Uh, that we have the opportunity to reimagine the way in which we manage the landscape so that we actually create healthy, functioning riverine ecosystems. Um, and how will that be done? Well, let's, let's look a little to the history of the Sacramento and hopefully that can give us some, some fundamental ideas about how river systems work themselves. Why would that be? Well, like I said, I'm a coastal kid. Um, and what I found when I went to, to school at Davis was that in the Central Valley, because things have already been so altered, because things are so broken from an ecological sense, there was a, an openness to entertain new ideas about how those systems might work and how they may be repaired. And that it was harder to talk about such things on the coast where people were still clinging to the idea that these, these rivers were working, that they function. But I mean, all you need to look to is the effort to identify a single coho individual in the Gualala, right? It's been elusive for the last, I don't know how long, it's the last, I don't know if several years is the right term, but definitely the, it, hard to find. So we know that our coastal streams are also badly altered. Um, and, and what the, the valley allows us to do as a model is to look at the fundamentals and to do it in such a way where we're not arguing over details, but we can get, get the big picture. So with that, let's look at a big picture story of what the Sacramento was. The Sacramento, before it was this, this mosaic of, of farm fields and agricultural production that we know it today, right? One of the most productive ag landscapes in the world and one of the most lucrative it was a, a diverse mosaic of wetland habitats. The truth is that in an average winter in the Central Valley, in both the Sacramento and San Joaquin Valleys combined, you could have 2 million acres of diverse wetland in uh, you know, any, win any winter. That's just absolutely and truly remarkable, right? And that this isn't, the point here isn't that wetland looks like any one thing. It could be towering, oak dominated riparian jungles growing along the natural levees of the Sacramento River and its tributaries. It could be the vast, and by vast I mean hundreds of thousands of acres strong Thule lakes that formed in what we call the flood basins. It could be emergent willow vegetation. It could have been open, uh, uh, open water. But what you had was this, this diversity, not just in space, but also in time. With every rainstorm, 
with every heat wave that caused a spring flush of snow melt, you would have had a different bloom of aquatic habitat, and especially of this critical uh, aquatic habitat, wetlands. And I'm going to talk a lot about wetlands today. Um, so the Sacramento Valley is actually defined. Its very name, it comes from wetlands. The counties uh, that, that we know today, Calusa, Sutter, Yolo, Sacramento, were before they were counties flood basins. A flood basin is a, is a, is a large, vast, shallow um, uh, extent of wetlands that would have filled with floodwaters every spring and winter and then would have uh, dried out, uh, an ephemeral inundation. Um, uh, and so this, this expansion of the wetted area was at the very nature of, of, of what a river is, this interaction, this flow of water over the underlying landscape. But that changed, right? And while the change was very pervasive, it's not complicated. We piled dirt next to just about every stream we had, right? This is a, uh, uh, a dredge uh, before the turn of the 19th century, just taking muck off the bottom of, of the, the channel and the wetland itself and piling it up along, alongside that. Um, but that was very effective. Over 13,000 miles of levee exist in the Delta and Sacramento Valley alone. This was a wholesale divorce of the landscape and the stream channels. But even more so, it was an act of drainage that not only was the channel, the river, the stream confined between now two steep banks, but that wetland on the far side uh, that used to be defined by, by those very words, wetland by long duration uh, inundation, by uh, staying wet uh, for months uh, uh, every, every winter uh, was now, uh, that the drainage was expedited. It was as if people are kind of like anti-beavers. We have a puddle. We had to do everything we could to get that, that water off the landscape. Now think about that. That's true. It's every, it's, it's your backyard. It's uh, the parking lot at Surf, Surf Super. It is, it is uh, every, every suburban uh, street. It's definitely every farm field. Uh, the human landscape is usually designed to get that water off the landscape as quickly as possible. And that's definitely true in the agricultural landscapes of the Central Valley. Um, but the Central Valley project and the, the reclamation I was just talking about fundamentally changed that, right? Um, ubiquitous drainage, right? Loss of over 95% of, uh, of the formally activated wetlands. Um, so what does that look like on, a, on, on the kind of that map scale? Well, that dot in the middle is the Sutter Buttes, the, the, the upheaval of a mountain range that's right in the middle of the Sacramento Valley. One of the smallest, you know, self-standing mountain ranges on earth to some. Others call it the, the, the farthest south part of the Cascade Range. Regardless, it's a bit of high ground in the midst of the valley and all those different greens and beiges are just different kinds of wetlands, right? And that's what it looked like prior, and this is what it looks like now. Almost nothing left. But what's important to note is the landscape itself didn't disappear. It was human land use and infrastructure that changed the flow of water across the landscape. Those low-lying grounds that were once formerly wetlands are still there. Today, they're largely farm to rice. This overlay represents the over half million acres of rice that exist within around 100 miles of the capital city of California, of Sacramento. So those, those formally activated wetlands are now still in some way, you know, valued for their capacity to hold water, right? They're, they're managed as agricultural production for wetlands, for a water grass, for rice, right? Well, the story of how we changed our perception, right? Before, I, I think that there's this idea that runs deep in the conscious of, of, of Westerners. And that's that, you know, fish belong in the river and the river belongs in its banks, right? And that those, that the, the, the river is a, 
is a thin blue line between these two steep levied banks. And it was the Kasumnis River, which most of you might never have heard of, uh, I, I would imagine. It's a small, it's the actually only undammed river in the, in the Central Valley. It flows into the, into the Delta um, uh, just below the, uh, the American Wither River and the McCullamy. Um, and what's so remarkable is that it doesn't have a dam. And what does that mean? It means that when it rains in the Sierras, the water flows into the system and it actually comes up. And in the mid eighties, um, the Kasumnis, like the rest of the rivers of the Central Valley had been thoroughly levied. And when that water came up, not much happened. If you have steep banks and you get a little bit more water, you don't change the wetted area. You don't create more wetlands. It just gets higher in the banks. But one flood, uh, uh, it broke in the lower Kasumnis. The, the levee broke and uh, uh, so much sand spilled out into the tomato field that the farmer decided not to, not to farm it. And roughly about five years later, uh, my mentor, Dr. Peter Moyle, went out there with his class and saw a floodplain forest reemerging. Oaks were coming up out of that sand in what had just several years before been a tomato field. And Peter, being an eminent ichthyologist, a, a fish squeezer, um, said, well, this is pretty interesting. What's, what's, what's going on with the fish? And he had a, a grad student, my, my colleague and good friend, uh, Carson Jeffries. And what Carson did was, um, was really important, revolutionary. He, he took fish and he, he put them in cages, which really hadn't been done before in the, in, the, in the valley anyway, small cages made out of plastic mesh. And he put some out there on the floodplain in that swamp, in that wetland. Everyone knew that Salmon belonged in the river, in the Crystal River. They just used it as a highway, right? To go from the ocean to the sparkling gravels of their clean headwater spawning areas. And he said, hmm, well, maybe. And he put these young fish from the hatchery, some out in that, in that floodplain, and some just on the other side of the levee in the river where they belonged. And what happened after five weeks changed the way we think about rivers and think about salmon. The fish on the left, of course, were in the fish habitat. The ones on the right of that cooler were the ones that were reared in a swamp, right? Reared out there on the wetland, on the floodplain. And what this gave was the first glimpse of what a Sacramento salmon not just could look like, but should look like. Here is what happens when you expose an individual fish to habitats similar to those that it's evolved to that it's adapted to, right? This is remarkable. Great, floodplains are important. Let's restore some. Well, the thing about the Kasumnis, I've already said, it's small. What we were working on was a postage stamp, right? That if we were working to recover fish, fish populations, millions of fish, abundance, it was gonna take more than that postage stamp. It was gonna take landscape scale change. And the landscape of the Central Valley is now this vast quilt of agricultural lands. It's our capital city. It's not going back, right? We're not going to return to hundreds of thousands of acres of waving tules that were so high that when Fremont came across the Yolo Basin, they, they, they worried, they fretted, they couldn't see a man standing on horseback couldn't see over the Tulis to see the coast range of the Sierras, right? We're not going back to that anytime soon. But what if, what if we can mimic that natural process, the spreading and slowing of water across the floodplain? What if we can do that and recreate those physical conditions on agricultural lands that remain in agricultural production? You have to remember that the valley is privately owned. What if farmers can make food for people in summer, but in winter, they can use those very same lands to create habitat that fish recognize, that they respond to? Well, that's exactly what we set out to try and study in, well, it's been over 10 years ago, in, in well, just around 10 years, in 2011, right? So could we take a rice field and manage it like a wetland? And if we did so, how would fish respond? Um, huh. I 
think you guys deserve to hear the whole story, huh? Well, I guess I was gonna, I thought that I would have the slides there of that first, um, of that first experiment. But let me just say um, that we took about 10,000 fish uh, and put them into this, how could that be fish habitat? It's a laser level dirt field. How could a fish possibly, you know, a salmon make it in that mud puddle? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, and yet after five weeks of putting these small hatchery fish into that, into that system, what we saw was not only did they survive, but they thrived. The fish in those flooded rice fields were growing at rates never before documented in fresh water. That we saw a fish that went in at about a gram and basically doubled its weight every week. Um, what we were looking at was the same performance that we saw in that remnant of natural floodplain on the Kasumnus. Yet this was in an agricultural floodplain. This was in a place that um, it really kind of boggled the mind, definitely the intuition um, to, to think that, that salmon habitat um, was, was out here on the floodplain. But it gave us enough of a, of a boost to raise the money to go from the corner of one, of one rice field to actually a 20 some odd acre laboratory on the floodplain built to actually ask uh, a series of questions about how this landscape could be managed to be more beneficial to salmon. And we spent four or five years out there studying uh, what farmers could do to the way that they, uh, they treated the rice stubble after harvest. Um, do you want to leave it high? Do you want it low? What happens when you till it back into the ground? Um, would deeper channels be good? Uh, all the different things you could think of uh, uh, out there in this, again, very simplistic uh, habitat. It's got to, you got to be able to do something to improve it for fish. And what we found after five years, and I, I uh, I'm not going to get into the the science, the, those the, the experimental details on this talk, as so that we can move towards, you know, larger um, studies. But that in in every circumstance, uh, whether it was in those fields in the Yolo Bypass or in fields uh, farther south, whether we were uh, providing uh, refuge uh, for those fish because we figured, oh man, they're going to get picked off by birds. Let's throw in. Uh, 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 refuge for them, uh, trees, uh, deeper, uh, deeper areas that would provide cooler water, better dissolved oxygen. In each one of those circumstances, rigorously, ex you know, experimentally tested, we found that the fish did just fine in what amounted to a rice field that was unaltered. That the most important parts of habitat, the provision of food and a place to hide, cover, were provided. The cover came from turbidity, from the muddy water itself, that they disappear into that water and, and are invisible. And then of course the food, well that's a, exactly the what we're going to get into. That's why these fish were growing so tremendously, right? So a millimeter per day doesn't sound like much here, but it can be from five to as much as 12 times as fast as we see fish growing in the river. Um, and we looked at this all throughout the valley in places on the, on the not just the Kasumnis River, but down on the San Joaquin, the Tuolumne, uh, in multiple locations throughout the Sacramento. And in every place, whether it was on a rice field or if it was in a natural uh, wetland, whether it was over flooded winter wheat or weeds or even bare ground, we found the same thing, that the fish three weeks after being put into that environment were much larger than they were when they went in. That we had a robust invertebrate food web that, uh, that formed within weeks of that, that ground being flooded. And this was true if you were using water, ice cold from the Feather River or water that was taken out of an ag, an ag ditch or even pumped out of the ground. Uh, every different water source, every different kind of vegetation and substrate, what we found was that when puddled, uh, three weeks later in midwinter, again, remember, this is always in midwinter in the very time that these fish are adapted to 
using this kind of valley floor habitat before it gets warm uh, in, in, in April or so. Um, the fish were, were thriving and doing very well. Well, I'll, I'll go over an experiment that, that, that explains that to some extent. Um, this was the winter of 2016, and we were using the same kind of cages that I talked about. Each one of those cages contained 10 fish. Each one of those fish had an had a electronic tag uh, surgically implanted so that we could track its individual growth rate and have very, very high statistical power as far as actually saying yes. Uh, we're sure that this amount of growth was happening in this location. So this is in the Sacramento River, one of the few places where you can get out of the current, where you can tuck in three of these floating cages. They're two feet deep by four feet square. Um, I've attached just uh, crab pot um, floats to the to the frame of the of the uh, cage so that it's floating in the in the eddy in the Sacramento River, um, and we put them in during a flood. This is. The one flood in the year in 2016 when the river was up and when this really represented the best possible circumstances and habitat water conditions for a small salmon within the sack out migrating through the sack river. Um, and we did the same thing just on the other side of the levee 30 yards the other side of the levee in the canal which remember canals are how water is moved across the landscape via human infrastructure, this is how we move water in summer so that it can be uh, uh, spread over farm fields for, uh, for productive purposes, for agriculture, right? So what we're really doing is saying, well, how can we rethink, reimagine, reoperate the very same infrastructure that we use for ag, this time to approximate, to mimic the environmental conditions that were here previously? How do we mimic those those, those patterns to which these fish are adapted. So just on the other side of the Thule Canal are the rice fields that now occupy the floodplain. Similar cages, similar fish. Um, three weeks after we put the fish in, we had another flood that meant that we had to, had to stop, the uh, stop the experiment. But in just three weeks, we got very, what were now familiar results. The fish in the river grew almost not at all. Those in the canal grew somewhat, but those on the floodplain were almost entirely different fish. Well, why does growth matter so much? Well, it turns out, and this is not just the Sacramento or the Gualala, right? This is for anadromous species, whether they're salmon, uh, steelhead, uh, Atlantic salmon, uh, uh, lake trout, any fish that goes to the ocean and back, um, what we see is that the size at the time of ocean entry is one of the best predictors of that individual fish will return as an adult. Meaning it's relative, but that all other things being equal, which of course they never are, but just the same, all other things being equal, a bigger fish is more likely to, a bigger juvenile is more likely to return as an adult. So what we're seeing here is that fish exposed to the kind of wetland conditions that used to typify the Sacramento River grow much faster over very short periods. But that means that these fish are gonna be large, meaning they'll survive in the salt environment in the sea, but they're going to be able to get out of the river when the river is up and turbid and cold, when the predators are not as active, uh, when they can't see through those turbid waters. So you have a really, really important part of the life history being expressed here, which is big and early. Um, this is a fish that is going to be much more likely to return as adult. That's our, uh, the, that's the, the fundamental premise of this work. So those floodplain fish grew 700% more in just three weeks. And again, that's just three weeks. They can be out there for six weeks, in which case you see that going. What we saw this year was why. And this is really getting at the heart of what I'll be talking about tonight. In the Sac River, in a cubic meter of water, we tended to see about 1,500 bugs of different sizes. In the canal, there was a lot more. 600% is more, in fact. And we saw that reflected in the growth of the fish. But look at that beaker on the left. The beaker on the left is solid. What's it solid in? Those are clodocerin. Those are, those are uh, daphnia. Water fleas is a common name for them. They're floating protein. 
This is a, a floating filet if you're a young salmon. This isn't just a lot of food, this is perfect food. And those young fish are basically swimming around with their eyes closed and their mouth open. What's so critical about that? Well, that is 15,000% more energy that these fish have access to than fish just 30 yards the other way on the other side of the field. This is starting to explain why levying and draining our river valleys leads so directly towards imperiled fish populations. What we're doing when we levy, when we divorce the river from the landscape, when we forestall the act of flooding, is we're cutting off the energy supply. The energy supply that moves into the aquatic ecosystem, into the river ecosystem, and actually builds, makes fish, makes the capacity of rivers to make fish, to have abundant fish populations. Well, what else is happening? It's not just that you have more food, there's reasons for that. And one of the drivers for that is what we call residence time or the mean age of water. What's that mean? It means that in the river, in the swift, cool river, the water's turning over very quickly, right? In every couple seconds, it moves past, it's off, right? In the canal, it doesn't turn over as quickly. It's every half minute or so. And on the floodplain as managed here, it's every couple days. So two, what we see here between two seconds and two days is roughly 100,000% greater. I mean, what we're talking about is, is five orders of magnitude more residence time. Why is that so important? Well, remember that wetlands, the, the wetlands, the, the, the floodplains that were inundated, that were flooded uh, before the development of the valley would have remained wetted, not for days, not for weeks, but for months. What we're talking about and finally seeing is that it takes time to route the carbon that is found out there, the energy that is found on the, on the floodplain into the water. What does that mean? What, what are we talking about routing energy? Well, we can, we can really get at it. From, from that experiment, we, we went bigger. We had almost 90 cages of fish spread out across the entire Sac Valley, every different kind of aquatic habitat we could think of from rice fields to managed wetlands, to real wetlands, to the bypasses, to the river. And what we saw when we looked at fish growth was, uh, was this. So the green represents different habitats that were within the river system. The, uh, the purple are wetlands um, and uh, the red are, are, are ag wetlands, are, are flooded ag fields. And then the blue are, are tidal, are down, uh, down up against the, the delta. Um, and, and what's just plain as, you know, plain to see is that all of those wetlands, all of the off channel habitats have much higher growth than do the river. But even more amazing is these middle river sites. Each one of those sites, it turns out, is a place within the river system that is just downstream of a place where water flows across an agricultural or a wetland and comes back into the river. These are places where you have floodplain derived food web subsidies. These are places within that food starved river system, you're getting some floodplain food, even though it's not hydrologically uh, connected in a way that allows fish to swim out there. You can, you can get the food to the fish in this case. So that, that opened up a whole new way of us thinking about the system. Um, but at its core is this, that inundated floodplains are a river solar panels. That while this isn't rocket science, it certainly is physics. That what we're talking about is the relationships of energy to mass. And that wetlands supply that energy into the system, right? And what you get out is biomass, is, is, is fish, is fish biomass. So by cutting off 95% of our activated wetlands in the Central Valley, why are we surprised when we only have 5% of our native fish? That's the math. It is explicitly designed, baked into the system that we built. But because we built it, we have the complete capacity to unwind it. 
to reimagine that water infrastructure and to do so in such a way that gives us an entirely different set of outcomes. To put the batteries back into the system, to build a system where our infrastructure expressly considers the way that nature works, right? So how does this work again? Let's just go over it one more time, right? Energy, that's all sunlight, right? That sunlight is captured by photosynthesis, by the act of photosynthesis. That happens either out there on the floodplain where it's captured by plants uh, growing during summer, or in winter, if you have a flood, right? That water spreads out on the floodplain. Why is that important? Well, if my, if my fingers represent the steep levied banks of almost all modern rivers, right? What happens with flood, right? Well, right now you have high volume, right? But very low surface area. There's very little surface area for sunlight in winter to actually hit the water. And what it happens when it hits the water? Phytoplankton, algae floating near the water's surface, capture that in photosynthesis, make that solar energy available to the aquatic food web. But the moment it floods, right? That water flows out onto the floodplain. You can't see my arms, they're so wide. That's the floodplain. Um, it extends the, the extent of the catchment for that solar energy exponentially. So whether it's winter sunlight captured by algae floating in floodwaters or summer's energy stored as the battery that is plant detritus, right? That's what that rice stock is, is it's stored solar energy. And it takes a flood, it takes inundation in order to get that carbon, that energy source into the water. And as every farmer knows, you can't plant a crop one day and expect to harvest it the next. It takes time for that. And in this case, that time of breaking down that, that you know, making available that solar energy st uh, stored in either uh, phytoplankton or, or plant matter happens via the microbial and fungal communities, right? And then those, those bacteria are eaten by, by small invertebrates, by bugs, and bugs are eaten by fish. And fish from small to big really rapidly. And now these big fish have a much better chance of returning. So it doesn't, you know, it, it's not that it happens instantaneously. It doesn't take much time, but it does take time. Making fish takes some time and we're putting that back in. Well, here's a great way to think about that, right? Here is a fish that went into the field on day one. And what you're gonna see is 10 fish photographed out of a single cage every week. The day they went in, those are all 10 fish. Here's one week later, two weeks, three, four. Five weeks later, you have an entirely different fish with an entirely different probability of success. What has happened? We've allowed the natural productivity that happens in puddles to route that solar energy stored in plant matter into the water and then into fish. What we're getting at is the very recipe of how we allow landscapes to create salmon. This is as true for the Gualala as it is for the Sacramento. No, there are no rice fields in the Gualala. Yes, the Gualala has been sped off the landscape in similar manner, not by levees, although as we saw the estuary was fundamentally altered, but by logging and road uh, building, by grazing, um, uh, but by, primarily by the changes to native hydrology that came with cutting damn near every tree. Now, I mean, I, I know some old growth left. Um, we, you know, I've spent a lot of time walking and snorkeling the South Fork from, you know, from basically equipped from Fort Ross and Kaz all the way down uh, to Twin Bridges. Uh, I have a place on the Wheatfield Fork and I've spent tons of time on Tombs Creek. Uh, the, the South Fork lower down is the place that, 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 uh, that I spent, I mean, Yes, the Gualala is amazing, but the Gualala has also been subject to the same landscape scale changes that fundamentally change the ability to route energy into the system in a way that fish can access it. And that's primarily true of the North Fork and other low gradient places. The places where water 
sinuously spread and slowed. The adjacent wetlands, um, the, the uh, inundated floodplains, the erosive capacity of the rivers that is a direct result of land use down cuts our streams and is as effective as a levee in separating a stream channel from the landscape. So a recipe for success, right? Spread that water out, slow it down. In so doing, we sink it back in. That means that wetlands persist throughout the winter. It means that globally, we are doing one of the most valuable things to human uh, societies, which is recharge our aquifers, which are the are really the bank account on which, uh, you know, a hydrologic society like California really depends, right? So in doing this, we have the capacity to spread water out and sink it back into the ground. Um, but fundamentally, we've been talking about growing it, that it's the act of spreading and slowing water that allows that my diverse microbial community to access both terrestrial and algal energy sources and route them into the food web so we can feed fish and create abundant fish resources. I call that puddle power, right? How could it be that puddles could be revolutionary? Yet this picture speaks very plainly to the systems that we exist, that, you know, that we manage today, systems that believe that, you know, fish belong in the river and a river belongs in its banks and, and what's possible. So, the, these two fish are exactly the same age. In fact, the top fish is a couple days older than the bottom one. The top fish represents, um, well, it was sampled from the Feather River when we were doing experiments. We sampled tens of thousands of fish looking for the largest fish we could. And this was it. That's as big as, as the Feather River, which can produce up to 70 million small fish in a year. That's as big as it can produce in April. Why? Because it's levied because it is fundamentally divorced from the power uh, that is possible in these wetland habitats. The bottom fish had access, as you just saw, for about four weeks to floodplains just on the other side of the levee. This is night and day. This is the power of actually integrating our knowledge of how nature works into how we, how we manage it. Jacob, uh, heads up on the time. Just Great. Yeah. So, you know, again, 95% loss of activated floodplains. Why are we surprised with 5% of our native fish stocks? What's important to note is that, you know, the landscape is still here, right? What you're looking at is an 1888 map where those uh, of the Sacramento Valley, where that shaded region represents the tules, the wetlands. And then it's going back and forth to a current uh, view of of the wetlands. What you see from space is that you still have the ghost of floodplains past. That, 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 that five o'clock shadow is the deep uh, soils that are indicative of, uh, of the silt that came in these. What we can do is reactivate, reignite the energy capacity, the productive capacity of floodplains here or in the estuary of the Guallala, right? So the floodplains still here and it's our job to mimic these natural processes and the way we manage the landscape to recreate these ecological functions. We can't go back in time, but we can look back in order to move forward, right? Um, and I won't go into the scale of the projects that we're doing in the Valley at this point, but it is truly a societal imperative at this point. And we're, we're making real headway. We're not talking about just investment in uh, restoration of a hundred uh, or even a thousand acres here, not even tens of thousands, but hundreds of thousands of acres on both sides of the levee of investment of not just tens of millions or hundreds of millions, but a diverse coalition of landowners, of farmers, of water users, uh, folks that people always assumed were going to only meet in the courtroom are now walking hand in hand into all of our elected offices here and in DC and saying, the best investment in our public money is in these nature-based solutions. Because if you're a farmer, more fish means a more secure water supply. And that's something that we have had large scale adoption of in the Sacramento Valley, where the, the idea of fish versus farms is, is, is rapidly fading. 
and that what we're talking about is a fish and farms, a capacity to integrate a knowledge of, of, of how natural systems work into how we manage them. There's a bunch of really other interesting ex experiments here, but um, I, I think that we'll just leave it at this fact that we just asked for $2 billion uh, for these, these landscape level um, projects. Uh, will we get all that? No, but the fact that you have conservationists, environmentalists, uh, bird conservationists and fish conservationists, folks from both sides of the river, both sides of the Delta, both sides of the aisle, uh, agreeing that we have a capacity to invest in nature-based solutions at the landscape scale. And if we do so, we can expect really landscape level recovery. That's, that's really a, 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 a brave new world. Um, and what I'd like to leave you with is that this is applicable again, not just to the Gualala, but to the Danube, to the Thames, to the Seine, to the Murray Darling, uh, to the world over where the truth is that people live in large river valleys, that in all those valleys in the developed world, we've, you know, it's terribly inconvenient to have that river move around on you. And we've levied it, we've straightjacketed it, we've cut off the river and the fish from that, from that landscape of energy. And it is not just here that we're going through these same kind of uh, extinction crises. The same is true in, in Austria along the Danube or in Australia on the Murray Darling. And in all those places, we're coming to a very similar uh, need to invest at this landscape scale. So this is, it's really interesting to be part of what I think is a, a global portfolio of solutions. And then the last thing that I wanna leave you with is that this isn't just about water, right? Water is my, uh, my wheelhouse, right? Um, but I'm a Californian. Um, we have all experienced the sky turning dark, dark with smoke or having the fires lap at our very doorsteps, right? We had the Wallbridge fire burned three times down uh, on my house last year here in the Russian river. You guys up there, are, you know, the Myers fire and others, I mean, so scary. But it is really a similar thing. What we're talking about is the flow of, of, of natural processes through the landscape, the flow of fire through timber, the flow of grazers across ranch land, the flow of water across floodplains, all have really similar uh, underlying processes. And it's where human land use and management interrupts those natural processes, where we interrupt the ability of the landscape to create and maintain the physical conditions, we call them habitat, they're physical conditions that native critters know, that they're adapted to, that they evolve with, that they recognize. When we, when we understand that, we have really a brave new, new world, a, a world in where uh, I, I think we've, we've proven unequivocally that endangered fish are not an inevitable consequence of development. They're a direct consequence of land use and infrastructure built at a time when we didn't know better. And now's our chance. Now's our chance to reimagine and reinvest. So thank you. Thank you, great. That's, uh, and thank you for a head load of information right there that, uh, that you delivered so well and uh, sharing your passion and your expertise. Um, uh, we're deeply appreciative of that. Um, and hope that maybe we can squeeze in a few questions and uh, some of the time that we have here. Um, uh, one of the ones is about hatcheries. I mean, do you have a 25 uh, words or less uh, kind of uh, edict on, uh, on what hatcheries, what their potential is, what they've, uh, what their role could be, and um, is there a role for them in this? I think there's a role for them, but it's not the role that they have been given. Um, that hatcheries, and I don't know, uh, Carl, is are, are folks seeing me, or how how uh, how should we do this? Yeah, they're seeing you. Okay. Um, so hatcheries, to a large extent, have been used as a uh, you know as as a band aid as a as this idea, as really a carryover from the industrial age when we thought we could replace 
the ecological function of a river ecosystem with a spawning bucket and uh, you know shipped in ground uh, forage fish from from Peru, right? And uh, uh, you could replace the rearing grounds, the wetlands I've just been talking about with uh, with a cement tank. And what we found is that those fish are domestic animals. That in a, a salmon in, in, in a very real way is an evolutionary uh, reflection of the watershed that it evolved in, that it that uh, millennia of adaptation has given it the evolutionary tools, the evolutionary key to the landscape's lock. And uh, hatchery fish are not that. They are domestic species, very, very rapidly, even wild fish brought into the hatchery become domestic uh, animals that have, and this is, this is just unequivocally proven at this point, a much, much diminished capacity to reproduce than wild fish do when reproducing in the wild. So what we've actually done with our, our hatchery stocks is mask the, uh, the long-term decline of our wild stocks. Now hatcheries, I think, do play, you know, can play a role if, if, we, if we update with 21st century practices uh, and use hatcheries to actually fulfill the objective for which they should be, you know, should be used, which is to make fish to be caught. Every single hatchery fish should end up on someone's table, right? That's why they exist. And we have the capacity at this point to redesign hatcheries so that they're not at the top of our river systems, but that they're at our bottom. What does that do? It means that spawning hatchery fish no longer compete with or even more detrimentally spawn with native fish. Instead, we can have hatchery uh, programs which are very efficient and which um, in, uh, basically nets and boats can uh, much more cost effectively capture those fish and, and get them to market. What does that mean? It means that you can have California fish back on California tables at the very same time that those hatchery fish are no longer one of the primary threats to sustaining wild runs. And that's what they are right now because hatchery fish have a tendency to breed with wild fish and in so doing uh, fundamentally interrupt the evolutionary process that makes salmon, that makes salmon evolutionarily adroit, adapted, uh, um, uh, efficient at, at, at working in, in a, I'm sorry, starting to, to echo on me. That's what I was, you guys, can you hear fine? Yeah, so good. A, a little zoom echo. So what I was trying to say was that, um, yeah, hatchery fish right now are one of the primary threats to wild stocks. And um, if we separate our management for wild fish in river and hatcheries at the base of our, uh, uh, of actually very few of our systems, we could end up with a much better, more efficient way of both producing uh, uh, well-adapted uh, wild stocks and fish for the table. Um, uh, one of the questions that I'm getting here, yeah, uh, one of the questions uh, relates to uh, obviously the differences between Central Valley and the uh, habitat there that in incorporate the, the rice fields with our uh, coastal river uh, habitat and um, the floodplains that we're used to basically, which are very uh, temporal in nature, but are obviously crucial to the, the habitat uh, or to the survival of the salmon. Um, owing to that, I mean, what would be your priority as far as, um, you know, if we had a magic wand, how, how we could uh, address the problems, let's say, on our river? I mean, if you could wave that wand, what would you do? Well, I think the first, you know, it, if we take that lens, this kind of, I call it the pivot towards process. If we think about where landscape scale processes are interrupted by human uh, land use management in the Gualala, right? We see that um, very clearly as the legacy of our, uh, of timber uh, and um, 
the footprint that was there was both in the estuary and let's we'll talk about the estuary here i think it's really important but as well as in the the landscape as a whole so uh, uh what we did was destabilized our hillsides which led to sediment uh moving down from the hillside into our streams right we're all aware of of sedimentation as a major issue um but we also allowed uh created very erosive conditions that led to down cutting of stream channels that very effectively separated um, what used to be uh, streams that were right at grade. Maybe it's best if I explain this with my fingers, right? I was talking about levees being these steep channels, right? So if you, if you think about a natural river, especially one like an estuary, a floodplain, uh, the delta uh, of, of the Sa Sacramento San Joaquin, any of the floodplains I was talking about, what you have is a very shallow slope between water and land. What does that mean? It means that with a little bit more water, you get all of this shallow wetland habitat. You get that expanse. The river expands out, creating incredible rearing habitat for young fish. So we talked about the, the energy flow and the food availability, but that's also the place that small fish that are really skinny, that's where they can avoid big fish that wanna eat them because the big fish can't get out there, right? There's a whole bunch of reasons where that wetland habitat that, that, that is really critical. And what happens when a river erodes due to uh, logging, during, due to uh, sediment deposition from road systems um, uh, is that, you know, it's as effectively creating these, these steep, levied slopes as if you actually levied it. Um, so what can we do in the Gualala? Well, um, there, I, I would say, look to those places where we have sinuous uh, capacity, those low gradient places. We've lost coho salmon, right? Um, here, I'm going to share my, I'm going to go back and talk about coho for a sec. Let's do this. Um, what are coho? Coho are basically, are you seeing my slides again, you guys? Um, Not, cows yeah. and fire. And yeah, the so let's, there we go. So coho are down here in the bottom left. You can see that the, the bottom left of those fish, there's a coho, and then there are three other species, uh, or two other species, there's a Chinook, and a steelhead. What I wanted to point out there is the big eye on that coho salmon. Why does that coho have such a big eye? Look how big, much bigger that eye is compared to the steelhead, which is the one that has the, the red on its side or uh, that smaller Chinook. Well, it's so big because it's used to these low gradient streams. Why makes it low, gra low gradient? That means that it spreads out. If you've ever seen a real uh, undisturbed redwood coho stream, it's completely undercut. The, the, the ferns grow over the top, the banks are underneath. Those fish are living in the dark. They are adapted to really slow, really dark conditions. They think of it as a, a beaver pond, right? And beavers are really important here too, right? So this idea, what, is, what does a beaver do? Well, a beaver slows and spreads, right? And so beavers are native to these systems, um, but we have to think like beavers. We have to think about how we can via uh, integ integrating large woody debris back into our systems, thinking about how the estuary actually functions, thinking about the tidal uh, interplay of, of, of the estuary and its uh, adjacent marshes. But what we want is that, that dynamic play of water and landscape. And it's gonna happen in a myriad of different ways. Uh, the North Fork, I think there may be chance for some actual floodplain there. Um, but mapping this, the, the Guala out where you can identify those locations where we can, can get not any one kind of off-channel habitat, but the greatest diversity of off-channel habitat as we can. And I think that, uh, you know, that's the real take home message from the work that, that we saw in the Valley is that, that off-channel habitat is gonna be different Remember that every single fish that comes out of the Gualala is gonna move down through that estuary. That estuary has the capacity to be uh, a buffet 
to to get those out migrating uh you know individual fish i i actually won't say smolts because sometimes you want fry moving out too what we're really looking for what resilience is based on is diversity and diversity of a fish population means as much diversity of the timing and the size of fish hitting the ocean as possible we want to hedge our bets we want to spread those fish out in such a way that when inevitable whether whether it be ocean conditions or or fires in the system or you know there's just the different way that storms happen at different times uh, all of those inevitable disturbances if we have the fish spread out in the system and spread out in their timing uh, will be much more likely to 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 buffer uh, those disturbances so uh, one uh, question as far as the um, buy-in that you had from your commercial partners out in the uh, in the Central Valley. Obviously, we have a little different situation here. Uh, are there any special magic juice that you could uh, supply us with that uh, would entice uh, landowners that we're dealing with uh, entering into similar partnerships uh, to do good things in our watershed. I mean, uh, do you have any, you know, hot tips? Well, I that? think that there are a couple things and, and most of it involves moving out of our, our binary corners, out of our, you know, it, there is this, this, this transfer from fix, you know, or from fight to fix, right? The, the idea of, of understanding that it's gonna take all of us uh, working together to create ecologically functioning river systems, but that if we do so, we really have a system that works much better for humans. Um, and so um, I think that, well, there's a number of different ways. I mean, the Gualala doesn't have a bunch of, of grapes yet, but as you said, you've, you've, you, you uh, successfully uh, fought off Preservation Ranch uh, Pinot development is something that that is learning, and there's possibility, I think, for you know, for having both Pinot and Coho, but we we really do have to uh, to kind of understand how how the system works. When it comes to to timber, I would say that at this point, timber is a really important. You know, we have to understand how this system worked previously. What am I trying to get at? That, that fire, that, that having a, a watershed that's been cut over three, four, five, six times, that is now full of, uh, of um, tan oak and bay and uh, just really, really dense, that it is, you know, I, I watched the Myers fire take off last year up steep slopes. It's just, it's, it's, we're living in a tinderbox and that's a direct result of the previous uh, uh, logging practices, but that doesn't mean that we can just walk away. Now we need to, uh, to take those tools and apply them ecologically so that we can initially uh, mechanically thin and then reintroduce fire to the system to reestablish healthy stands of timber. And in so doing, we can reestablish healthy hydrology. And in having healthy hydrology, we get uh, uh, the amelioration of these sedimentation issues and erosive issues that lead to the degradation of fish habitat. So I think that starting to understand that, uh, that, that ecological timbering is absolutely necessary to move forward. And that gets to the heart of your, your issue, Chris, when you know, it's, not, it's not either or. Uh, we really have to be moving with end and how do we move forward? How can we create economically viable kind of forest management techniques that allow us to move towards some, something that is akin to ecological function within our coastal, our, our coastal forests, yeah. whether that's redwoods down in the draws or, or apex dug for a pie. Um, and I don't have answers to that per se, but that's the direction we have to go. Yeah, one of the challenges is to hopefully convince landowners to look in the longer uh, the longer picture and see that you know for instance recovery is to their advantage and that the fish have a big part of it i mean one of the uh, the the folks on the chat points to the fact that the historically much of the nutrients that were 
basically a, a, at the base of high productivity in, in a watershed like ours were, were produced by fish carcasses that, you know, were died at the side of the river or were dragged up uh, into the hills by predators, um, you know, so it goes to the fact that everything's connected to everything else, as we all know at this point, so. Yeah, no, I, the, the salmon are so amazing in that capacity. I mean, almost everything flows downstream with gravity, right? And the uh, not just erosive sediments, but energy tends to move towards the ocean. And here is this this creature that gathers and and concentrates that marine energy and brings it back, not just into the fresh water, but into our very headwaters, where it becomes a a important, a critical part of not just bears and 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 trees and but flycatchers eating the maggots which come out from the 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 carcasses after a fresh it puts you know the, the spawned out carcasses up into a willow. And that flycatcher then flies to Costa Rica and starts depositing you know marine nitrogen from the from the from the from the northern Pacific. We're talking about a, a web of of productivity of of inner dependence that is that is not just marvel but 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 you know it's truly amazing and and um, and we do have a chance to to kind of reignite that productive fire here in our in our um, in our own systems uh, and 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 once it gets going it does feed on itself um, so um, there is hope All right. Laura, you want to say a few say a few words at this point? Well, I think um, first of all, thank you so much, Jacob. This was amazing, generous, abundant, uh, just like the uh, the floodplain um, fish we've all been fed well tonight. So thank you so much for all of this information, and I hope that we'll have a chance in the future to have you back and talk talk some more. Um, thank you to everyone who's attended. Um, I, I hope that you all uh, have found it to be as interesting as I have. This has just been great. Um, I think we've put into the chat box um, some information for you if you wish to make a donation. Um, and uh, I think that's it from me. Um, anything I'm missing here, Chris? Um, I did put in some links from uh, Jacob uh, in regards to sources of information that uh, you can go to. That uh, State of the Salmon report is in there, all 600 pages if you would like some midnight reading tonight. Um, and that was uh, linked earlier. I'll, I'll cut and paste it again. Um, and uh, we'll try to, uh, to deal with some of these questions. They're very, the, the questions will, uh, We'll catalog those, and if we can somehow kind of get an answer to you on our website, we will try to do that. But do uh, do look at these sources of information that uh, um, Jacob has shared. And uh, um, but, um, uh, oh, one one other thing. Excuse me, Chris. Um, this uh, presentation has been recorded, and we will, uh, as quickly as we can, get uh, the link to the video up on our website. It won't be immediate, but do check back. Um, and within a few days, we hope to have that up there. Um, so uh, I think that's it. Thank you everyone for coming and um, have a wonderful rest of few hours of your Earth Day. Thank you so much. Have a good night, Thanks. everyone. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah. bye, -bye.